Hi, I'm Doug Foltz. Welcome to the CAA's Art on Demand program and welcome to Saltcrust Studios. This is where I get to work every day and for the next hour or so, you and I get to spend some time here exploring the studio, exploring some of the things that inspire me as an artist about this magnificent place where we live. Um, and what I hope to do is take a painting from beginning to end for you. Um, everything from canvas preparation and underpainting to subject selection, compositional concepts, uh, and ultimately managing palette and light, uh, and some of the techniques that I use uh, in the oils that I work in. So, I'm glad you're here. I hope you find this interesting. At some point during this program, I will flash an email address up across the screen. And if you have any questions about anything that we explore here together that you want to take a little further, please, please don't be shy. Get in touch. Always happy to talk with anyone about anything having to do with creativity in the arts. Again, thank you for supporting the Cultural Arts Alliance of Walton County through this program uh, and for all that you do as an artist or a patron of the arts here in Walton County. So, let's start right at the beginning. What do we want to paint? Um, it sound, may sound like a silly question, but sometimes that is an extremely difficult question to answer. Uh, sometimes a, a big blank canvas can be an awfully intimidating thing. Um, every aspiring writer has been told to write what you know, and I suppose every painter should clearly paint what they know and what they love. But I think we need to leave room for exploration. I was born and raised in South Miami, Florida, spent my life running around uh, the upper Florida Keys, the Florida Everglades, the Bahamas, an absolutely gorgeous spot on the central Maine coast. Um, so for me, my happy place and where I go to all the time uh, for my strongest feelings is, is the coastal landscape. I love wet, salty places. Uh, and 40 plus years of living here in South Walton County has done nothing to change that. But I also absolutely love the human form. I think we all experience the world through our bodies, through human form, and anything I can learn from work there about proportion, I think will positively influence, uh, influence my other paintings of coastal landscapes. Um, I love abstraction, the idea of creating a feeling or an idea with the absolute fewest uh, possible lines is, is intriguing to me. So I sometimes make conscious decisions to explore other areas and bring them back to my go-to spot, the, the coastal landscape. Whatever you decide to explore, whether it's florals, portraiture, coastal landscape, inter interior land abstracts, um, get to know your subject. Ultimately, I think we all need to paint what we see, but in the end we need to paint what we feel and share that with the viewer leaving a little room for that viewer to discover some of his own feelings as well. So the more intimate you become with your subject matter, I think the more that's going to come through in your painting uh, and the more that is going to um, come through for your viewer. So for me, again, go-to place, happy spot is the coastal landscape, and that's where we're going to go next. So now we've made some basic decisions about where we want to go, what we want to paint, and how we want it to feel. It's time to start bringing that into an actual painting now. And you may have images that you're working from, photography, sketches, studies, uh, whatever it is that has set the direction for your painting. It's time to think about how canvas size, or maybe more importantly canvas proportion, is going to affect that. The human eye we see in a roughly a 16 by 9 horizontal proportion. That's why all your big screen TVs and your, your uh, killer laptop screens are all at that proportion, essentially. It makes things very real. So if your intent is to create a painting that easily brings the viewer into a very real feeling scene, then that may be something that you want to consider. If on the other hand, you're looking to willing, I guess, to maybe make the viewer work a little harder, but use that canvas proportion uh, and that orientation to affect the feeling you're trying to create, then you may want to think about something else. Turning that horizontal proportion vertically, uh, creating, uh, whether it's in that same 16 by 9 proportion or not, will emphasize the verticality of the view. It will minimize foreground and emphasize background. 
Uh, if that's important to the field you're trying to create, you might want to consider going vertical. Um, for me, I personally like a square format. I think that it makes the viewer work harder than ever to become a part of the painting, and I, because it's so abstract in its proportion, but I think that's a good thing. Um, it doesn't allow you to see it as reality, and it doesn't emphasize one element vertically or horizontally. And I think that balance spot for me, and for what I tend to paint, uh, is important. Point is, it's a conscious decision. We're not just doing this by accident. Now, there are hundreds of other things that influence proportion and size and canvas selection, but be sure that what you're doing, that the limits you're setting, the edges you're building, work for the way you want your finished painting to feel. This might be a good time, too, to, to talk about gear, and I will try to do this throughout this video uh, when I think there's a tool or a piece of equipment that I'm working with that I, that I think might be valuable for you. The, the studio is absolutely full of easels and all sorts of equipment, but the particular rack or easel that we're going to be working on for this painting together um, I think is probably worth talking about. I cannot take credit for the design of this. The first time I saw it was in the studio of a fellow named Michael Dines, painter, uh, but it's a simple two by four construction, about four feet square, about 10 feet tall, and it leans up against a, a beam high here in my studio and has these removable dowels that allows me in these pre-drilled holes to very quickly move a painting up or down. And it's incredibly, incredibly stable. So with the two of them side by side for the scale of the things I work at, uh, you know, allows me to do up to an eight foot wide by eight foot tall piece. Um, whether you're painting in a professional studio, a room in your house, whether you're painting out of the back of your truck, plein air, whatever it is, getting your gear, your kit, your tools right so that you don't have to worry about those, you don't have to think about their performance, and you can focus on what you're trying to create with that canvas is a really, really important move. And as I said, I will try throughout this video to point out where I've built or I'm using some sort of a special tool that makes that kind of, of uh, thinking more effective for me. We are going to start some underpainting on, uh, on our canvas, and this is a fun time for me. Big, bold strokes, lots of color, get to play a little bit, um, and it, uh, I get enthusiastic about it, which is why we have covered the piece on the canvas uh, or on the easel next to us. I think if you ask 10 different people what underpainting means, you'll get 10 different answers. For me, it does two very, very important things. We are going to be spending a lot of time on this canvas uh, creating contrast and using that for, for our all-important composition. So uh, I'm going to be pushing darker pieces darker and pulling lighter pieces lighter. And for me, I find that really difficult to do on a stark white canvas. This has been primed three times, but uh, if I can get a layer of color on there now that's at about a 50% value, then it's much easier for me to push and pull from that middle ground. So the first, first positive for me in underpainting is the creation of that middle ground. The second thing is that it's going to help us unify our palette. Uh, I'm going to use an oxide red here, which I use all the time. It's, uh, there will probably be none of it directly visible when the painting is finished, but it will influence all of the colors that sit atop it. One of the great things about oils is their transparency uh, and your ability to use them almost as glazes at times. And, and whatever that undercoat is, uh, is going to have an influence in unifying the palette, and I think that's going make it, to make it a much better piece. The color I am using uh, today is an oxide red. I uh, have read about this long ago and used it on many, many of my, my paintings for many years. Uh, this happens to be a, a, a Windsor Newton color, um, oxide red. As a rule, I work with Gamblin products. I find Gamblin to be uh, an environmentally responsible company. I think that from a chemical standpoint, and you spend a lot of time around chemicals in places like this, uh, they're very respectful and, and uh, they create a good product. And I actually love their color line. Um, but they don't make this particular red in this particular value. So this is the one we're going to put on this canvas now. This is that oxide red. It's very soupy right now. Um, actually, probably a little too soupy. So we're going to go straight on there with some of the pigment and change that. But basically, I just want to get a coat on here. And as I, as I said, sometimes what you find in this, in this little stage is some fun compositions. Um, kind of a good, good way to get your groove on with uh, with mark making. be 
fine with this at all. This is, uh, this is really just creating coverage. But as I said, those early stages are kind of fun around mark making and, uh, and composition, playing with composition. So there are times, and I know some people when they do underpainting will stop at a spot like this, and while that is still wet, begin to lay out the painting, actually pulling some lighter areas into it if we wanted to pull some clouds up into this area or thought that our composition involved reflective water down here. Um, I've done that a few times. To be honest, I like the solid layer. I like everything that it, it does that I discussed earlier, unifying my palette and giving me that easy 50% middle ground to work from. So I'm going to wrap this one up and then we're going to get into laying out our painting. This is Stella, the studio dog. She's been around for most of our shooting, but she's been a good dog staying behind the scenes, rocking that COVID cut, just like the rest of us about three weeks into this uh, the studio sequester. But she's gonna help us out today as we move into composition because composition still is king. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the golden mean, the rule of thirds, and how that's gonna apply to the piece that we're working on together. Palette color temperature, value, contrast. We hear those words thrown around a lot in all of the visual arts, and those things are all absolutely critical. But they all serve one master, and that is composition. As painters, what we want is to make our viewers look exactly where we want them to look in our painting, and once they get there, we want them to make sense of everything that they saw on the way in. And the way we do that, the way we move their eye, is, is through through composition and how we use palette and color temperature, how we use contrast, how we use value to move that viewer's eye around. Um, generally in a painting, I like to have one spot that is absolutely clearly the darkest spot and one spot that is absolutely clearly the lightest spot. And how those two things uh, sit on the canvas in relationship to, to one another is important to the way the viewer interacts with that. Now there are hundreds and hundreds of theories around composition. Two of probably the most well-known are the theory of thirds, which is used a lot in photography. And uh, the other is the golden mean, um, which is a, a proportion derived from nature uh, and from the way tree branches grow, from the way our bodies are formed. And generally, when respected, simply creates a pleasing image or a pleasing composition for the viewer, regardless of, of, of what the medium is. So what we're going to do next is explore those two concepts just a bit and then talk about how we're going to apply them to our painting. Stella has been sleeping, but I'm going to call her back to help us out with this next step. This is simply a pleasing image to look at. It feels comfortable. Everything from where she is in the water to where the sunset is as it, as it hits the horizon and the reflection that's throwing on, uh, on the outfall. If you overlay the golden mean, this is how those things come together. That proportion, that composition is comfortable. And if we overlay the rule of thirds, simply dividing the canvas into three parts, vertically and horizontally, you see that it also has an effect here. So while those may have been intuitive during the, 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 the initial shot, um, they play a large, large part in how comfortable you are. The same is true of here, of, of this shot. This is Stella on the beach again. Um, if you overlay the golden mean again, you see how that, the focus of that spiral brings you right to where I want you to look in the painting. And if you overlay the rule of thirds, you can see its effect as well. This is Alicia in palm light. Uh, on Mike's porch in Abaco in the Bahamas. Same thing, golden mean, the rule of thirds. These are not the only influences on composition. They are big ones, but there are all sorts of other things to talk about, like leading lines and the concept of centering. I have an old wooden boat christened, uh, christened Last Chance. She was, uh, she was actually born the same year I was, and she is a great boat for taking out on the Choctahatchee Bay and up near the mouth of the Choctahatchee River. And she's a good boat for red fishing. And not long ago, I was doing just that. And 
as I turned to come home late in the afternoon, the sky color and the shapes of the marsh in front of me were, were wonderful. So I shot them, and, and as I looked more and more at the piece, it gave me a great sense of calm. And so that's where I want to go with this piece, but I want to be sure the decisions we just made around composition are going to work for us. And so I want to be sure that as I lay this image out, and I've cropped this, manipulated this slightly so that I've, I think I might be close, but what I want to do is get that, that golden mean that we talked about, that pro comfortable proportion that brings me right into this portion of the painting. Cloud lines, uh, what's happening with water and marshes here, all of that is going to become, uh, is going to become our guide. All right, sometimes you might want to literally measure this part out. I'm eyeballing this right now um, because we're about 17 minutes into this video and we got to start getting some painting done. It's a little tough to see maybe, but I've taken that golden mean, working from what we did on the iPad earlier, and laid it out very, very roughly sort of here on this canvas. And what it has told me is that the hot spot in this painting for me needs to be right about here, both in the sky and down here in the horizon. Uh, this is going to be our horizon line for the painting. And one of the things that happens, because we're painting a coastal scene, one of the things that happens in the coast here is that when, when clouds settle down on the water, there is a space between the horizon and the clouds, and we want to respect that. So this. This might happen right here. This is actually the key spot in the Golden Mean Run that we did here. But the other thing that this is telling me is that not only do I want this to be the hot spot in my painting, I want to be sure that all of the other lines in the painting are working towards that. So even when I'm working with, with cloud angles on this side of the painting or cloud angles over on this side of the painting, which is going to be our most dramatic part of it. Um, I want to be sure that they're generally working me down towards that point. The same is true with what we might want to do down here with, uh, with water lines or even with lines back in here into the marsh where we've got uh, where some of the grasses and grass lines are going to push us. We want to be sure that everything is moving us to this spot right here. This is where we want our viewers eye to go and everything we do from here on out is going to be aimed at making that happen. I did want to give you all at least one other view of, uh, of the studio of Salt Crust, a broader view. Um, this is with the big roll-up door, wall door behind me open. We've been shooting most of this with it closed because uh, it's the best way to control the automobile noise that you've been hearing behind me for the last five or six seconds. Uh, but the lighting that this wall and this door provides is absolutely critical. This is actually one of my favorite easels to paint at right here just because of its, of its, uh, its full-on natural light. Looking at it here, clearly this may be the most uh, embarrassing shot in, in the video. This is my primary work table, runs down the middle of the studio, kind of separates a sitting in a working office area on one side from all those big racks and easels behind me. And it's where all of my tubes are laid out and all of the tools that I use to paint with. Um, my wife, Alicia, is a painter as well, and every time she comes in here and sees this table, it drives her absolutely crazy, but it works for me. Uh, top row is neutrals, whites, grays, really dark grays, warm grays, light gr or, uh, cool grays, uh, all of the Portland series from Gamblin. The middle is uh, warm colors, reds, orange, yellows. Um, bottom starts with some warm greens, then into cooler greens, blues, and really light blues. So, had to get you over here because this is, uh, these are the tubes that I generally work with, and depending on where I want to push a painting, I'll then limit the palette from there. And where we're going to start on ours is, uh, is with the sky because it eats up the most real estate in, in our piece. And now that we have it laid out, I want to uh, begin using palette and color to make things move in that composition as well. Uh, indigo blue on the left, an array of uh, light, middle, and deep Portland grays on top, uh, a neutral uh, beige that I'm going to use to probably push a little bit of warmth into some, some of the clouds. 
which is also why the Naples yellow is in there here, particularly in the south and particularly at the time of day that we're talking about here where I want that sense of warmth and calm. Uh, bright doesn't mean whiter, it means more yellow. So we're going to use Naples yellow to make that happen. Speaking of white though, two different whites in here. One is, is a Gamblin warm white, which is, does just what it says it does. It's a wonderful warm white to help keep paintings warm, more human, uh, and, and certainly with the type of feel we're looking for here. But it's not good for changing the value of colors without changing their hue. So there's nothing better than a good old titanium white for that. So those three, six, seven, eight tubes are where we're going to start as we bring this thing onto the canvas. We are, uh, we're about to get dirty, start laying the sky in, and I'm going to start work with a, with a rather large brush. This is big, strokey work, a little sloppy right now. As we get closer, we're going to get probably a little tighter with it, but in the beginning, I'm just trying to block in some colors and use what we worked with earlier to, uh, to set my basic form for things. So this is simply paint, paint, paint time. We're going to bring this sky in, start it a little dark in the top upper edges. You can already see a little bit of, of where that, that red is beginning to affect things. Um, that can actually be a little dangerous at times. It can push you into some pinks that you may not want. But I think where we are right now, we're probably okay. I want this sky a little darker at the top because I want it again to bring us down into the bottom of the composition. But instead of using white, what I'm using here is Portland gray light. Now, this is this is really loose at this stage and as we get tighter we'll start pushing a little bit and telling the paint more about what we want it to do but there's always in my mind a spot in the painting where I have to stop telling the paint what to do and let it bring its own thing to the game so I'm gonna be working with the blues the lighter blues as we get down closer to the horizon and then I'm actually gonna work in pasta wet on wet with all of those other colors that we pulled, the, the whites and the yellows, to try and create that cloud form that keeps our composition where it needs to be. That transition of darker blue at the top of the painting down to a lighter blue as we get to the horizon, again, is drawn just from the way we see. Next time you're out uh, on a beautiful day, look at the sky and look at the density of, of color at the top of your, your uh, field of view and how it gets lighter as it gets down towards the, the horizon. Now, that doesn't mean that, that we have to totally follow that, that pattern. I'm going to use this a little bit here, again, to help us create that contrast that I want once I start pushing clouds in back on this side. I used the word soupy when we were talking about underpainting here, and I should probably tell you what I meant by that. The, the pigments that come directly out of the tubes are thinned to use in, in various ways when we're painting, and I use two different mediums for thinning. One is Gamsol, which is actually a solvent, not a medium, um, and it tends to make things really light and really transparent, but it can also take off paint layers that are below that. I'm not too concerned about that at this stage, so I'm using that now, but as we get further into the painting, I'm going to use another product called Galkid, also made by Gamblin, um, that does that without destroying the, the, the layers of paint underneath. And it's a little thicker, glazing kind of approach. But right now, I'm starting to, as I'm blocking in and moving down towards this horizon, starting to work wet on wet with clouds. Uh, you'll see me get a little finer with brush stroke, but still just using that soupier mix. Starting to pull those cloud forms together now and starting to let some areas go darker and lighter. I don't want this to look too false, but I do want to respect those compositional lines that we talked about earlier. So I'll pull some clouds up into this area as well, keeping the contrast low. And I'm going to start now using some of that Naples yellow to bring some of that warmth into the areas that I want right down here, just above the horizon. I'm not real concerned about being too fine at the horizon right now. That's going to be painted over and over and over again to create a little bit of fuzziness and a little bit of some distance 
in the piece. But uh, right now, I really just want to start up here and begin to work things um, down towards our basic compositional form and make this that calming, comfortable sky that I talked about when I was uh, when we started the piece. A lot of uh, a lot of what I'm doing right now is I'm feathering these forms in has a lot to do with with brush pressure. When I'm really scrubbing hard, obviously the edges get much softer and much lower contrast. When I'm barely dragging the brush across the canvas um, is when we start to get some of these harder edges where things begin to define themselves and take shape. Again, I'm counting on the paint to help me out a lot here. All right, about uh, <clears throat> 20 minutes or so of continued pushing and pulling with that same basic palette that we worked with before, the indigo, uh, the three different colors of Portland gray, titanium white, warm white, and then a little bit of that, uh, of that Naples yellow. This is probably still not the final configuration for this piece, but it's beginning to do what we want it to do. It's beginning to recall for me that calm sky. We're going to let this dry more. This will probably get another couple of runs at it, like the one that you just saw, uh, until we start to get the layers and a lot of the translucency that we really want in it. But the basic forms are in now, and the basic areas of warmth uh, and contrast levels are starting to come together for me. I'd still like to lighten up portions of this sky. That'll come at a later date. What we're going to get into next is this ground plane. And when we pulled the palette together for this sky, we're going to use some of those same colors so that these two relate to one another. Um, but I'm also going to pull a lot of what I recall from that afternoon, which was some of that wonderful warm gold and green colors that you get in the marshes out in the Chalkahatchee Bay. And that palette has been pulled together. And the first thing we're going to do as we start on that portion of the painting is bring this horizon line in. are not going to be any finer with this ground plane than we were with the sky. This is probably still just our first pass down here as well. But in addition to striking that horizon line, what we're going to do is start to start to push darker areas of grass, wet grass, and lighter areas of water, reflected light that pulls some of these sky elements down in, into the foreground. And we want to be sure that we're doing that in a way that respects that composition that we talked about before. I'm looking at that same image on the iPad right over here behind the camera. And as, as we get into this, we may pull a little bit of our new palette in, uh, some of the yellow ochres and some of the, the brighter greens just to begin to get a sense of light. But for the most part, I'm working with a, a deep olive uh, and a, a, a color called Van Dyke Brown, which is a deep dark brown, to really begin some dark areas and, uh, and work with the light water areas.
right, we're starting to get some basic foreground forms in now. Water, wet grass, and a little bit of light. But I'm beginning to see a bit of a palette difference between the foreground and the sky. And I want to pull a little more lightness back up into this area. Remember we talked about that space in the south or on the water, on the coast, anywhere between water and the bottoms of clouds. And clouds have shapes. They have sides and tops and bottoms and they all handle light differently and we'll get back into that at our second run on the clouds but right now I want to I want to create a little more space between the horizon and the bottoms of those clouds. The larger that space is the closer one feels to whatever is happening on the horizon. The smaller that space is the further it feels away. Again next time you're out looking at the water notice the difference between things that are close to you and how that space is handled and things that are further away. Right now I'm going to take a little bit of this lighter color, this warm gray uh, indigo mix that's happening and create a little bit of a harder line across the, the top of that horizon between the clouds and the water. I'm doing this, this in a way that gives me a harder edge at the bottom which is sort of where I want it, and a softer edge at the top. And as all of this feathers in and becomes more a part of the, the sky formation, that'll begin to take shape. Also, we've probably got another two or three passes at that horizon before it, uh, before it takes its final form. All right, we've got a long way to go here still, but uh, palette is beginning to unify for me. The compositional lines are starting to work and I'm starting to get a feel for where I want to push light and where I want to let darkness and shadow come in. Uh, we need, have a lot more work to do on this horizon. We'll get into color temperature there using some cooler colors to push things further back on that horizon and uh, then letting the warmer and darker colors back there lead back out into the marsh area. Need to let this dry for a little bit. We'll come back and do another layer. I'm laying all this stuff out as if it's science or rules or laws, um, and of course it's not, it's art. So while all of those concepts and the ideas that we've been, been working with uh, should guide your thinking, in the end you have to step back and look at things and say, what do I like about this, what do I don't like about it? And while there are some, we still have a long way to go with this one, but while there are some things down here in the ground plane that I like and some things up in the sky, I don't like the way the two of those things are working together. And as I recall that day, it was a much lighter, brighter feeling sky. So we're going to do, um, we're going to do something different here and lay it in a light glaze over that whole sky that will bring, create some separation between the sky and the ground plane, and hopefully bring back a little bit of the feel that that, uh, that I felt the day I first saw this scene. Do not adjust your devices. We have in fact turned the painting upside down, which is not a bad thing to do every now and again anyway, just so that you get a different point of view. The reason we've done it here though, or the reason I've done it, is that from this horizon line down right now, we're going to put a very wet, very thin glaze on this canvas right now. It's made up of Prussian blue, which can be a very strong overpowering blue, that Naples yellow that we're using to, to, uh, to, to unify some of the warmth in our palette, and titanium white just to gray things out a bit. But it's a very soft green that comes off as blue, and I think as a glaze over this blue is going to add a lot of depth to our color and to our sky. 
Uh, as I lay this soupy mix on, I'm going to take it off immediately with white, uh, white cotton rags, and I'm going to leave heavier concentrations where I want more of that glaze and that color and lighter concentrations where I don't. Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. We've kept the basic compositional lines that we had. Um, we've kept the transition of dark sky at the top to lighter sky at the bottom going, but we've generally lightened things overall. And to be honest, I think I'll probably, that glaze went pretty well. We'll probably do another one of these um, yet again as we get into pulling more detail in there. Next though, we're gonna start working with really creating a picture within a picture right here in this ground plane. As we do this, we are going to be sure that we're driving more contrast, higher saturation, more detail of stroke on that left third side of the horizon in our composition. That's our hot spot. That's where we want people to look. And our field, again, the way our eyes work, we may have that roughly 16 by 9 proportion overall, but our brain only allows us to focus on about a 13 degree cone wherever our eyes within that framework tend to focus. So uh, that's where we want our hot spot to be. Now here I am getting all, uh, all technical and ruly again and don't mean to. Really, I just want everything that you feel as you move towards that hot spot on, again, roughly a third of the way in, on our horizon line to bring you even more fully into that place and again once you get there then to step back and make sense of everything that you saw on the way in but everything that we do here as we start to pull the tail into this foreground is going to be aimed at making that happen essentially we are creating a painting within a painting uh, respecting the larger composition but still focusing all of our energy on, on that spot Finally, second set of work on, uh, on the ground plane, finally foreground. We are going to start at the horizon and work back to front on this, pushing some elements in that horizon much further back by using some cooler colors and some violets, essentially going dark and fuzzier at the horizon then and moving from dark to light as we move out to the foreground of the painting. Um, always, always respecting that, that cone of vision where we want our viewer's eye to go. So, Things in that area will become brighter, higher contrast, higher chroma, tighter strokes, and then as we move out towards the periphery, we're going to uh, make things more peripheral, a little darker, a little softer, not such, uh, such recognizable strokes. This is actually really one of the good parts. This is where things start to become real, and, uh, and using stroke and using color and contrast to make that happen is is an exciting part of the painting. Palette is, is still based on the same core palette we had before. Olive green, I'm gonna use some yellow ochre to, uh, to, to create some of the highlights in that, that uh, gold grass, some gold green, all of these things cut with titanium white where needed to make them lighter or keep them darker. And on the water areas in the foreground, it's the same indigo blue and Portland gray mix to allow us to create darker water and lighter water. 
this is where things get good. Not finished yet, but certainly beginning to feel uh, the way that scene felt to me as I left the mouth of the Choctahatchee River that afternoon. We'll probably do another glaze or two on the sky to bring some added richness and some layering into those simple cloud forms. And there needs to be a, a number of darker areas pushed in, particularly in the, in the heavy foreground uh, of the, the marsh plane and the ground plane. This is very wet right now, so we need to let it dry for a couple of days before we take those next steps. But in general, I'm beginning to feel the light, and I'm certainly beginning to feel the respect that we paid all along to our early planning work in that composition. This is going to feel for the viewer exactly the way we want it to feel. Finally figured out how to shoot with the big bay door open. Um, simply record the voiceover separately. So did want you to get a quick look at salt crust uh, with all of the natural light that that bay door lets in. This is an important space for me. I work here a lot, spend a lot of time here, and, and uh, I'd like it to work for me and certainly like um, what this light does for it. This is sort of a sitting, thinking, working area, a bit of, a, of an office within the studio. Beyond that, of course, is all the big easels and racks that uh, we've been talking about. and. 
that, uh, that central work table of mine in the middle. Um, beyond that is a, is a little area that I call the hubble, which is uh, stairs up to the loft. And then um, this is a low ceiling work area where I can get tight, do a lot of small studies, uh, use this particular bench for watercolors, charcoal work, uh, has a, a light table, flat files, um, just a workstation for me along with another, another layout table as well. Um, but most of the most of the painting takes place on those big racks on that one wall. Beyond that, uh, this area of the studio, I'm not sure there's much here that's of interest to you. Maybe these. Um, I do an awful lot of plein air small work. I certainly like to paint big, but um, I do small studies and I do a lot of work plein air. And there's always something to learn from those quick short paintings. Um, have been doing them for years and then bring back to my to my studio work. So um, there are a lot of people that I know do this every day and I, I don't, I wish I had that discipline, but anything we can do to get that kind of practice in on those small paintings um, always informs the larger work. So that's a pretty good look at salt crust. Um, just wanted you to get a feel for what the, the whole space looks and, and feels like. We let this get really, really dry, more than a couple of days, and uh, came back in with a few additional sessions to do another glaze on the sky, to change the chroma, add a little bit to that luminosity uh, that we know is going to come out even more when we put a coat of varnish on this that we haven't done yet. Uh, a little more compositional work with the clouds down near our hot spot, and then an awful lot of work with shadow and highlight uh, in, in detail here in the marsh, all to create that sense of light that sense of calm, the feeling, uh, as much as what we saw, what we felt, or what I felt the day that I saw this out on the Choctahatchee Bay. So, we're gonna call this one. Uh, it's, um, for now, anyway. It, it's, it's getting warm here in late spring, early summer in Walton County, time to roll up the big bay doors and get some air moving through here. But, but to be honest, th th this is often a difficult, uh, a difficult thing to do for me, is to decide when to stop working on a painting. Far and away, my best day as a painter 
was the day that I started focusing on painting the verb rather than painting the noun. When I lost concern for the finished piece and got more excited about the process and the journey, really good things uh, started to happen for me. Uh, but that makes it difficult to know when to stop. But we're going to call this one for now. Many of my paintings are painted to a title that I might have pulled from poetry or from literature somewhere. Ours, of course, was not. This was uh, painted to recall a particular feeling of calm and comfort that, uh, that I had out in the marshes of the Choctahatchee Bay. But still, I would like to combine that uh, with something drawn from what was in my head and in my heart uh, and from the time that, uh, that we spent creating this. So I am going to go to literature. I'm going to borrow one of the better known quotes from Ernest Hemingway that goes like this. The rain will stop, the night will end, the hurt will fade. Hope is never so lost that it can't be found. Now, I have done a number of paintings over the years entitled Hope, um, but what I liked about that passage was that as dark as this time has been, um, the fact that, uh, that, it is never, that hope is never lost, I think is important. So we're going to call this one Never So Lost, Hope Number Three. I hope you approve of that. I hope you have enjoyed being with me as we created this painting. I'll be honest, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this. Uh, I wasn't going to tell you that up front because I wanted you to stick around. Uh, but the act of creating a painting and then and, and, uh, cataloging or capturing what you're thinking and what, you, what you're doing while you do that uh, has been fun for me. It's been exciting. It's been a, a, new, a new part in the journey. Um, and I hope that's what you take away from, from this session. Uh, I hope one. I hope you enjoyed it. Two. I hope you you found it interesting and and uh, maybe learned a thing or two. But all of that underlying theory and concept uh, is good. But what what you really need to do as an artist, even as 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 a an appreciator of the arts, is to explore, explore the work, explore the process, and bring more of yourself uh, to your art. If you can bring more of yourself to your art, art will bring more. To our society and that is the promise that it holds particularly in times like this so i thank you again for being with me uh, for this hour for choosing to share 60 minutes of, of your life with me um, please come by salt crust studios 393 just south of highway 98 in south walton county uh, in the warehouses of santa rosa beach if the big bay door is open and the loud music's playing i'm here and thank you for all you do to support the arts in walton county and particularly for your support of the cultural arts alliance of Walton County. They do an awful lot to bring not just the power of the arts to our, our culture here, um, but to bring hope as well. Thank you. Stay safe, stay well.